You know, the human brain, if you have an average brain, you're capable of almost anything because of the complexity of our brains. Billions and billions of neurons, hundreds of billions of interconnections. It can process more than two million bits of information in one second. It never forgets anything you've ever seen, anything you've ever heard. And uh, you know, with something like that sitting up here, why would you ever utter the words, I can't? I can't, two words that hold us back and keep us from following our dreams. Many years ago, the words I can't might have defined Ben Carson. Not that you would ever know that from where he is today. Ben is the world's foremost pediatric neurosurgeon based at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. In 1987, he became the first person to successfully separate Siamese twins joined at the brain. He's also the subject of a Hollywood film, a philanthropist, and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Amazing achievements, made all the more impressive when set against his troubled childhood. Well, you know, uh, growing up for myself in inner city Detroit in very desperate situations, and we lived in a tenement, large multi-family dwellings, boarded up windows and doors, sirens and gangs, rats and roaches. It, it was a miserable environment. I was a pretty awful student. Um, and didn't have a lot of belief in myself academically. And uh, neither did my classmates. They all thought I was stupid. They called me dummy. I was the butt of all the jokes. But uh, despite the fact that no one else believed in me, my mother did. You know, we were very poor. There was never money for anything. But it didn't cost anything to get a book from the library. And between the covers of those books, I could go anywhere in the world. I could be anybody, I could do anything. It was like an escape from my world of poverty and violence to places that you could only imagine. Almost as a side effect of the reading, I was looking at words all the time. So I learned how to spell. And I had to take those words and put them into sentences. So I learned grammar and syntax. I learned how to express myself. And you have to take those sentences, you have to make them into images. So you learn to use your imagination. All of those things are extremely important. Hello, my name is Layla, and my mommy has epilepsy. Maybe your mommy, daddy, or someone else in your family has epilepsy. I hope this book will let you know what to do if they have a seizure. My mommy wears a special necklace to tell Half a world away from Baltimore, in the city of Bristol, UK, lives a remarkable young lady called Layla. An avid reader with a limitless sense of wonder for the world around her. Layla turned her passion for knowledge into a profession when at the age of seven, she became a published author. There wasn't a book about adults with epilepsy for children and and I thought it would be nice if it was written by a child as well. Because if you didn't have this book, you would think, oh, what shall I do? I'm doing really well today. Layla's mum, Sarah, developed epilepsy following a head injury when she was a child. Alongside being mum to Layla and her baby sister, Sarah also works as a carer for adults with learning difficulties. Even with her medication, Sarah still has unpredictable seizures and it was trying to find something to explain why they happened that led to Layla's amazing achievement. I looked everywhere for a book about epilepsy aimed at a child who's got a family member with epilepsy but there was just nothing out there. I noticed Layla was carrying around a notepad and I was curious what she was writing in there and uh, had a little look and she'd written loads of information about epilepsy. <laughs> This is a really good idea, so I looked into having it published. Local publisher Pomegranate Books thought so too, and put Layla's book to print. So far, it's sold over 300 copies around the world and has set Layla on course for her future career. I want to be a writer. Um, I'd like to write adventure books, story books, information books. I am very proud of her. 
It's lovely seeing how vivid imagination she's got. It just takes me back to when I was a child. She's uh, eager to be a teacher and she's also wanting to write more books. For example, uh, she was asking my father-in-law uh, about his diabetes recently. So I know she wants to write a book to help children who's got a family member with diabetes. I just think it's amazing that she just wants to help so many people. It makes me feel really proud. We can learn a lot from children. Their sense of wonder and thirst for knowledge puts the world at their feet. It was this discovery and a strong faith that set a young Ben Carson on the path to an extraordinary life. I would get on the bus and I would go downtown to the Detroit Institute of Arts and roam to those galleries until I knew every painter who painted each picture and when they were born and when they died and what period it represented. And I was always listening to my portable radio, uh, listening to classical music. And, you know, I'd be walking down the streets of Detroit listening to classical music and people thought I was nuts. This guy's crazy. But years later, when I decided that I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, well, I wanted to go to the place that's best known for neurosurgery, and that would be Johns Hopkins. But as I said before, they only took two people a year out of 125 applicants. But when I got an interview and I went there, the fellow who was in charge of the neurosurgery residency program, George B. Uvrahai, was also in charge of cultural affairs at the hospital. And uh, somehow the conversation turned to classical music. And we talked for over an hour about different composers and their styles, conductors, orchestras, orchestral halls. There was no way he wasn't taking me in the program because he had to have somebody to discuss these things with. But what I emphasize to young people all the time is there's no such thing as useless knowledge because you never know what doors it's going to open for you. And uh, the more you know, the more options you have. We cannot trace you know, the origins of a thought. We cannot define where imagination comes from. And I'm not sure we ever will. Because that exists in a different dimension. The brain is the conduit through which we reach that other dimension. But we have no way of quantifying and measuring it. But we do have the ability to enjoy it and to use it to the fullest extent.